So learning objectives are understand uh, your data, apply statistical methods for analysis, and test sequences to come out. So basically what we do in this chapter uh, is see some statistical techniques that are used for analyzing data, in particular for genomics data. We will have a look at the descriptive statistics and more common distributions. Then finally, we will attempt at answering some questions. In order to do that, we will use regression resampling methods. To conclude, we will we'll discuss about the possible approaches for best estimation and make some metrics for regression and classification. So, uh, let's do this with the uh, chapter aside, just to, you know. Okay, so basically what uh, uh, is important um, in many fields, not only in bi biology, uh, when you analyze your data, uh, the first thing that you do uh, is search for the um, response variable that you want to analyze, and then you uh, look at other um, vectors in the data that may be able to influence your response. So uh, calculate the mean and the median, and so all, all those uh, descriptive statistics, which are like the um, standard deviation, the variance, the confidence intervals, all these this, uh, descriptive statistics are very useful for understanding your data. So, the first thing that you mean is basically a way to understand the, the um, tendency uh, of the factors um, that you. Um, uh, investigate a bit more. So, for example, here is this a certain number of experiments, and uh, they they uh, made this visualization considering um, the the mean, of, okay, of this gene expression for that is came out from from each experiment. So, you can, as you can see, they tend to group around this this value, which about a little bit more than, than six, and and this value. Uh, so this visualization shows that this this all the all the values are roughly around the mean. So there is a central tendency for, for this uh, gene expression that can be taken uh, into consideration. Um, so, but uh, when we um, talk about the mean, so we need to think about that. So we know uh, how to calculate the mean. Okay, this is the formula for making the mean. So we we sum all the the, the values that we, we got, and then we divide it by same numbers. Okay, this is just arithmetic. And um, the, this value can be influenced by some factors, such as if um, if our data are some outliers, okay, so the mean can be affected of these outliers. So the value that at the end it releases is a value that is slightly, you know, different from, from, can change a lot if there's some outliers, okay. While the median, just to do, um, this is like, it can be made, of course, um it's a less affected of the of the by the, the outliers because it's uh, basically releasing you the 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 fifty percent of the data uh with um, there are in the bank. So uh, you you sometimes it's good to use the mean, sometimes it's good to use the median. It depends by the distribution, uh, okay, of of, of your uh, of your data. Other and then we will see what we are talking about with this term, with this term distribution. I'm going forward because the, the the final part of the chapter is the most interesting one. So I suppose I 
I can uh, even give these things for uh, as a background knowledge. Okay. This, mm, there, there are other, mm, so uh, as I said, there the, the, the might be outliers. Outliers, what are they? they? They are evidence of variation within the data. So there are some uh, type of measurements that can be used for, for taking consideration of this variation. And this is, uh, these are the range, so we can uh, consider the range of the data. We can calculate the standard deviation, the variance, um, and an adjusted variance for, for some uh, census that is, is the use of one, and even the percentage. So big say percentage are very important because they take consideration of the frequency. So the numbers of times some 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 value repeat themselves. So if we um, for example see we run um, a random uh, uniform okay of ten and we calculate the mean, we can see that the mean, for example, is a random uniform as a it's very stable uh, you know uh, distribution. So the, the 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 mean and the the mean and the median are very similar, okay, quite close. While uh, in other under condition, um, the, this might not be the case. So if, if we do a random norm, um, for example, with a certain mean and certain standard deviation, then we um, can see that there is some uh, variation at a certain level. And a standard deviation, is a, a, the standard deviation is the square root of the, the variance. Uh, I don't know if you like to go through the, the formulation of this uh, this uh, this statistics, or I uh, can just uh, go forward. Uh, with that. What do you think is uh, would you like to go through the the formula of this? Uh, um, the mean, the, uh, the, the bias, the standard deviation, or would you like to go forward to the, chart, the rest of the chapter? Um, can you really quickly go over when it's better to use the variance versus the standard deviation? So in my work, I've always been told us to use like you've got your mean and then you've got your standard deviation of your sample population, but are there times where it's better to just to use the variation over standard deviation? Yeah. Um, that, that's for, for when, when you do replication of your data, okay, you have a, a larger sample. At that point, you, you need to do an adjustment that takes consideration of the, uh, of the sample data that you are uh, considering. So it's not just your data, it's when you're resampling on a larger number. And then uh, that, that, we, that we'll, um, uh, we will talk about that. So basically, this is the, uh, the formula uh, uh, for uh, calculating the variance. No, the variance is um, basically a deviation from the mean, but uh, it's squared. The sum of squares, right? Is, yeah, the sum of squares. Um, okay. And basically, it, this uh, uh, gives you an idea of what, how your uh, points, let, let's imagine that they are, uh, their points vary uh, within each other. And um, it's very important because usually when you um, make a model and when you want to analyze your response variable and, and do attempt estimating means with the use of with the help of uh, other influencers like other predictors then you you consider the difference uh, with your data uh, and um, uh, so this you you're going to take consideration of the variation of the data okay and um, Okay, so let, let's see that this is the uh, when, when we this is the adjusted variance and uh, this is the um, the sample variance. So the the standard deviation, so which is basically the the square root of the sample variance. 
and um, we, we will see that in the book it's a bit forward this uh, yeah. this discussion because uh, um, sometimes you you use the uh, uh, you use the uh, the bias and uh, the standard deviation, but then uh, if if you have a sense of frequency of the same values, it might be important to investigate the um, uh, so the percentiles. Uh, so uh, to investigate the percentiles, you use uh, you can use, for example, if if we have uh, as the same as before a random normal, uh, we can um, consider the interquartile range of uh, this is the range and the and the quantiles, the single quantiles. What are they? Okay. They are basically the, the, in, in the ratio, so in percentage, uh, how many times each uh, set of values repeat themselves. Uh, so you, you basically uh, have this, uh, this, this um, uh, box plot that show you, show you, for example, in this case, that the median which is the 50% uh, in, indicating the 50% of the data, uh, it's uh, on a side. And then here you have 26th percentile and 75th percentile, which, which are uh, just the 25% of your data or the 75% of your data. Um, and um, in this case, for example, this box plot shows that uh, the, the distribution may be little skewed, so it's not very um, centered or on a 50% of the. Um, it, it's not exactly a bell skewed, okay? So it's, it's likely. Um, um, uh, okay, so. And um, what I try, uh, we can say is that uh, um, we are to, now talking about distributions of your data. And what is a distribution? So basically, uh, we consider the probability of occurrence. Okay, and the, the uh, statistical distribution basically what, what does is uh, um, representing the um uh, let's say um, representing uh, how um, uh, how much of the data is uh, um, within around the, the mean value okay so basically um you have a certain number of values, they repeat themselves, and uh, all these values have a, 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 a central uh, a central value. This, this, uh, this value here uh, uh, is very important because the, the, uh, that means that uh, uh, a larger amount of this data will be around that value. Okay, so that's why you see that uh, you, you can see peaks within the curves. Okay, so here is an example of, for example, of, the, of uh, some type of distributions, and we have like this red bell curves, which shows mean zero and standard deviation 0.5. And they, they are all, um, except this, this yellow one, all centered on, around the zero, uh, on zero, um, while this, this yellow, uh, the, the mean of the yellow distribution is uh, minus two, uh, with a, a standard division of one. And so you, 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 things might change, okay? But you, you, this is an example of normal distribution. So you can see clearly that each one has a bell curve uh, shape. Uh, so you have no doubt about that. But uh, you might have different types of, of distributions. So they may have a 
couple of pigs, more than one pig. Uh, mm, they may be skewered on the right, so that means that the uh, uh, the tail uh, may be longer on a side more than a, another, and they are called left or right skewed. But in general, in biological data, so you when when you you have some data and you do some uh, replication for investigating how they can be they they can possibly behave. Uh, it's uh, very likely that you um, uh, tend to to have uh, a belt distribution, so a normal distribution. And this is in fact uh, proved with a, a theorem, which is the central limit theorem, and which shows you that. When uh, you do a certain number of replication, uh, you then uh, cannot um, um, estimate uh, the shape of your, of your distribution as a normal distribution. So, um, and so uh, um, basically, uh, within the distribution mentioned in the chapter, uh, it's only a normal distribution or said as a Gauss distribution, typical value. This is what is mentioned, the, because it's, it's typical within biological data. So now the, there is a little example, uh, and this is what uh, we are talking about when we, um, so we want to investigate the variation of, of the data. Uh, so we can uh, even, uh, um, so we have a certain data, what, what we do, we want to see, you know, how they are at present time. So when we look at the data, but we don't know what's happened if they change. So to, to give an estimation of this variation, this, this um, possible variation, what we do is uh, uh, doing resampling. And here in the, in the chapter that shows a uh, um, technique, which is the bootstrapping. So bootstrap resampling or bootstrap, I said bootstrapping. And this basically estimates intervals as a way to estimate intervals. And uh, what it does is uh, um, repeatedly taking samples from the original data with the replacement. You have a certain number of data, you take uh, a part of this data, uh, which is a sample, and this sample then will be replicated with replacement, and, and, and then uh, you have other, other samples. Uh, so you basically have your data, you divide your data in different samples, okay, and then you replicate them with replacement. So they can repeat themselves. Uh, I don't know if you have used library, no size, but that's uh, before because I'm, uh, but this, this library is uh, useful because as a, um, Mm, it gives you the, uh, besides the fact that some data, uh, you can uh, basically do bootstrap resampling with the replacement. Uh, there's other functions for, uh, to, for doing this uh, in R, which is bootstrapping, for example, or other things. But you know, here in the book, they do with the mosaic package. Uh, and so what you do is to do, for example, you have this uh, random normal uh, with mean 20 and standard deviation 5, uh, and um, you have 50 values, okay, uh, and then uh, um, you want to do bootstrapping, okay, with the sample. To do that, in order to do that, you would do a thousand, you want to do a thousand times replication with the sampling of your data, and you multiply this uh, by the mean, uh, which is a mosaic mean, and it's not just the plier with the do function, but there is a, uh, the intervention of the mosaic package, so you do the mean of the resample uh, of your sample. Then they calculate the quantile uh, of this uh, uh, thousand uh, resamples and set uh, the limits so it's not from zero to one but they are interested in within 25 and uh, no point nine mm. so 
that'd be like a 95% confidence interval. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Two and a half percent on each side to make 5%. Okay. Yeah. And then they do an Instagram to, uh, to see the results and see that uh, the uh, 25% um, and the 97.5%. So these are the two uh, interested. Um, then you want you might want to investigate details, but basically what's inside. If, if you want to investigate like outliers or uh, extreme events or other things, you might want to investigate details. Otherwise, you are interested uh, about, uh, on what is inside the the confidence interval. Okay, let let's uh, just. Uh, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure uh, the, the central limit theory is very important. So when you do replication, then you what what you do is con uh, construct the, the confidence interval using a standard distribution. Then take repeated samples from a population with a sample size, and the distribution of the means of those samples will be approximately normal with mean and standard deviation. So basically, if you replicate your data a certain number of times, which is enough to um, quite high number of times, you then your data tends to um, accumulate around the mean, a central mean. So that's why it's the central limit here. Okay. So any questions? Uh, not so far. I think that this is a really good explanation. Um, some of the things that, again, like I, I know most of it, but it's good to see it again. And then also like, that was a very clear example of what exactly bootstrapping is. That was probably the clear, like the example that here, and then how you explained it, like, it's a very straightforward process, but when I see bootstrapping in other methods of things, I kind of just have gotten overwhelmed. I'm like, how do you do that? But it really is just taking the same yes. sample and just over and over and over, just picking different parts of it. It's nothing crazy. <laughs> Basically, what it does is uh, uh, taking your original data and sampling one, uh, taking one sample based on, uh, for example, you want to a thousand applications, okay? So it takes a sample of your data and it replicates for thousand times. And it, if your data are not enough for replicating a thousand times, it, it replicates them. Um, so it allows for uh, for replication. So you can uh, like, uh, but it's maybe it's not that clear, but um, it's like cross validation. It's very similar. So like, like you, you have a, a sample of data, you take a sample of your sample, and then you replicate that certain number of time, and then you take another, the, the other uh, sample of the data, and then you replicate. Well, anyway, uh, what they do is using a function which does all the work for us without uh, doing <laughs> like uh, uh, all the calculation. So, what is going to happen here is that um, so the rest of the this section before the, the, the this one here, the rest of the the section uh, shows you some examples about uh, uh, normal distribution because in R, I don't know if you know that in R, if you want to uh, like make synthetic data. You can do that, like with uh, this function. That this is a distribution, normal distribution. And then uh, you can like set the, the value of the bean and the standard deviation. Okay, and you want to like see, you can set a value or you can set more than, than, than a value. So you, when, for example, in this case, when X is equal to minus one, uh, how does uh, what what is the 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 z value? Because uh, normal distribution releases a value which is uh, um, standardized value. Okay, 
and uh, it has a certain um, uh, mean that is standard deviation. So basically, what this function does is calculating um, the, the z value that you can uh, find here. Okay, for example, uh, the, as I said, the, uh, the distribution is nothing else than uh, calculating the, um, the the probability, okay, of a um, uh, of a certain number. Um, let's say the probability of occurrence, okay. So this is what a distribution shows you, okay. And uh, so our, what is the probability that some occurrence is within your data can be defined? Uh, for example, if I want to know what is the probability that some value is x, it's uh, uh, less than uh, minus two. So for example, here, this is the distribution of my data. It's a bell curve. Let's say that I've done the certain limit theorem. I've replicated my data. So now I'm in a great environment. So I can trust that uh, all the data that uh, I'm searching on, on a certain uh, area uh, will be significant to me. OK, so I'm, I'm now investigating uh, what is the, uh, the probability that um, x so that a value can assume uh, the, the can be minus two. Okay, what is the probability? So um, what is what is that? Um, is that the value is minus two is here. So if I got my probability would be uh, excluding what is not. So all the values that are greater than minus two. So I'm not interested in that. I want to know. And then um, what I found is all the values that are less than, than minus two. And the, this function basically gives you the, um, uh, the, the the area uh, of the probability where you your value can be. If you say I, I want the probability that my value will be less than minus two. So within this this uh, this yeah. 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 yeah, considering that uh, the, the, your distribution has a mean zero and standard deviation two, for example. Okay, so. You have other uh, other functions, and um, this is the probability, the norm of the the norm uh, distribution. Again, for this value minus two, so this is the probability that, which is six, about sixteen percent, that you can find a value in this. Uh, in this area here, based on a distribution, uh, normal distribution with mean zero and standard deviation two, uh, the probability to find, on average, the probability to find um, your value um, less, which is, will be less than minus two, is um, six, about 16%. So, and then you have uh, this p norm that can be, uh, for example, if you do lower sales, uh, add these uh, options, then you calculate the opposite. So you are now considering the other part of the area. In fact, is exactly the other side. Okay, so about 80%. So let's go a bit forward, then you can, have, you can replicate our, um, normal distribution with a na random normal distribution and uh, uh, again the, the q norm uh, which is, um, is the value that's corresponding to your your distribution which the area of your distribution which will be greater than a certain number of values y it can be 
can be different, different, not just one value that they can. So it's a, a, a virus. So here there's a like uh, a bit of uh, explanation of what are they. It's quite uh, interesting. So I'll go a bit forward because um, the uh, that's more. Can I ask um, one quick um, the yeah. difference between the it was the p norm and the d norm? Like when would you use the density probability versus just regular probability? So yeah, like the first two examples of this part, the so I, I understand yeah. the p like what is the probability, but then the probability density, like what is the difference between those two? One is the area and one is the probability. Oh, the, okay. So the density that. is the actual area of it as opposed to the actual like chance of it happening. Yeah. Okay. And then when would you yeah want to know the area versus the probability like the area is more like the actual number or is the air like for the probability the density probability okay so let's say that the the area is uh so the density probability is always one is that there is a bit of confusion because they are always the same numbers okay yeah because you know the probability of Finding one event inside your area is always included between zero and one. Okay, the probability is always between zero and one. Right. Again, the area is again can be between zero and one. Mm -hmm. Because it's a probability area. So you can uh, find an event on a certain probability area. Okay, so yes. the probability area is more like what you actually have versus what is theoretically possible with just the probability. Am I yes. understanding that correctly? Yeah, okay, yeah. okay. Basically, this, let, let, okay, all this curve is 1% my area. It's one percent. Right. This uh, little area, purple area here, is about fifteen percent mm -hmm. of, of my under percent. Okay, let's say that this is hundred percent area. Okay. This little area on purple here is, let's say, less than twenty percent. So let's say fifteen percent of my total area. Inside this 50% of my total area, there is my value. And that value can have a probability to be there. Okay, and that can be 18%, for example. Okay. Oh, 18% <laughs> chance that it's within that 15%. Yeah. Okay. As opposed to an 18% chance of it being in the entire there we go. Okay. 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 I see. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Just a little bit more precise. Yeah. It's uh, the thing that makes confusion is uh, that this this uh, value here, because when you search the probability that X, which is your value that you are searching for, is within an area, because this is less, it's not equal. You are not searching for a precise value. You are searching for something that's less than, so less than, so you're searching for an area. So this is mathematically calculated with an, um, an, in, uh, an integral, okay? So you calculate the integral, which is the area. But, uh, uh, so this probability will be the probability of the, to find your value, not a, uh, uh, you are not searching a precise value, but you're searching a range. So a certain, okay, it's minus than something else. So you're searching an area. Okay. While when you're searching a point, a precise point, you do the Z value. So then like the Z minus one, the Z mm -hmm. value is the value that can be found uh, on the tables when you, Found the probability that the value can be there, you put 
you you search you search on the table on the normal table and you find the z that z right. value can yeah because it's always under percent so the area is always right. under percent so the values are quite all the same okay okay it's that is, uh, changes okay okay i see okay um mm -hmm. Uh, what else can we say? Okay, yeah, we already said that. Uh, okay, here, for example, this, this is what we are talking about, okay? So your Z value, okay, it's always uh, included within 1.96 and minus and, and 1.96. Because these are the, the, the values that are being translated from the distribution, so are the probability of the points at the uh, at the limit of the confidence interval. So twenty five percent probability, and, and this is minus one point ninety six and ninety seven point five percent. The probability to find the point is one percent. So then, okay, this is uh, like a bit tricky, but you have the, uh, the, the, the formula. So basically, you, you might have different type of distribution. As I said, you might have B-model, uh, exponential, uniform, and many others. But in general, uh, they all get into a normal distribution when you do the sampling, if they have uh, residuals, which is, um, you know the very the variation uh, behaving normally. Okay, so we are talking about Gaussian. Uh, okay, Let, let's go and say what what's happened if we um, basically we want to uh, measure our variability. How do we do to measure our variability? Okay, we we can make it. it Hypothesis testing. I go be forward because we have 10 minutes and uh, I think I left the, the best part. Um, so basically, we do hypothesis testing when we we want to um, analyze some data. Uh, let, let's imagine we have two, two vectors and we want to compare them. So the first things that we do, we do the difference of the means of these two vectors and then we make a hypothesis. And so if the new hypothesis is uh, H0, and if these uh, two means, uh, the difference of the means is zero, then uh, this is my new hypothesis. If, if otherwise, my alternative hypothesis is say and not zero. So basically, we can compare the real difference and measure how likely it is to get uh, such a value under expectation of the new hypothesis. Here there is an example. Uh, they use randomization again uh, because basically uh, it's like testing on new data, and uh, they uh, replicate gene do two type of genes and uh, with a random normal uh, with different means. Okay, and then they do the the mean difference and. Uh, they set some uh, uh, groups like test and control. They have to, to basically the same as before. We do some uh, risk dumpling and an histogram to see what happens. Basically, H0 said there is no difference in mean. Okay, so we sit and say we know that there is a difference. But this is four, and this other is two. Okay, the result of our that there is a, um, a difference. Okay, so uh, let's go a bit forward. Then the, uh, we calculate the probability to find a value around the scene, and uh, uh, this is quite uh, low. So it might be uh, that we need to reject our new hypothesis because uh, uh, it's not. Uh, the, the, there is a mean. Lower than 0.05. Yeah, it's like statistically significant. Yeah. Okay. 
so basically uh, what's happened is that uh, we can make other tests uh, uh, to to compare to to distributions so this is the welsh test or t test this is basically done uh, on uh, normal distribution but generally uh, when you do the sampling, you can uh, even apply to different type of uh, this initial different type of distribution. Okay, uh, this is a t test, and uh, then what happens is that uh, uh, once you have more than two uh, vectors to compare, so you you don't have just one hypothesis, so you just you you don't have just uh, one new hypothesis, one alternative hypothesis. You have a certain number of uh, new hypothesis, certain number of alternative hypothesis. So to do this, in order to do this, uh, you uh, you can make um, when uh, number gets growing. So there, there are some adjustments uh, that are called Boncaroni and uh, the um, uh, and the um, uh, the um, uh, random. Oh my! Um, okay. So basically, when you check for for the values that are not all positive. Okay, so the family uh, white has a rate, the family uh, white has a rate, and the uh, so for this reason, you uh, to do that, uh, um, you basically do a replication of your of your values of, of your hypothesis, and you do multiple testing. Okay, uh, I think we we have a few minutes, but if we have a look at the results. Uh, our Q value uh, is here, it's the black line, while the correct the boncaroni correction, this is the, the Q value means that uh, uh, you have calculated the new hypothesis, the alternative hypothesis uh, for each couple of your uh, vectors. Okay, so you have a certain number of values, and this is the trend of um, your Q values. Which is that there is a difference between t values and q values. So, but that, that this is the thing somewhere else. Um, basically, with uh, a, a little correction of the Bonferroni, you imagine that uh, uh, um, because you have done replication of your data, so you imagine that you make a list of one error. Okay, so it's not that. that your results are saying that you owe uh, the percentage of your significant uh, results are exactly um, uh, what you found. So you, you want to like mitigate your errors and find a compromise uh, because uh, you have done the application, you have uh, uh, more data. And so you can use this uh, uh, little corrections uh, on the t values, which is not anymore just five uh, percent, but is a correct value, so it's a five percent uh, divided by the sample size. Okay, so basically you restrict your. Uh, okay, Let, let's go forward and see. Uh, that there is um, uh, so this, this is the part which is so interesting. Uh, basically, um, when uh, if you have many variants. Uh, that you have calculated for thousands of genes across samples, uh, you can force individual variance estimates to shrink them towards the mean or the median of the distribution variances. And so basically how much the values are shrunk towards a common value depends on the exact method used. And these tests are in general are called moderated t-tests or shrinkages. Uh, so this is uh, something that you use, uh, uh, with, like um, mathematically saying with this formula, and you go uh, uh, searching for background variability, and you consider that as the prior, and then 
to find the individual variability uh, of your values. Then uh, the, the, stra the uh, strength values is the, uh, what is the result of this uh, application. Basically, playing within uh, with A and B, these two coefficients, you can adjust the estimation of this part. Now they, they've used this D, but you can even use D dot. I think they, so, and the X and the, so, for the X is, uh, and the D dot, uh, because at the end you are estimating uh, uh, value mm, coefficients. So okay, let's, let's, uh, this is an example that shows you um, what happens uh, within tests and sequences. And so this is with 28 tests and this is with eight tests. Um, maybe if we have like a bit of time, we can go back. So finally, um, what we um, let's say that we have now understand understood what what is the central tendency of your data. Okay, we want to like attempt an estimation of the res our response variable that we choose. So now we select again a predictor that might be the most uh, suitable one influencing your your response. And here are the intercepts and the the coefficients for your prediction. So in general, the approximation of the response, uh, this, let's say that this is, is your data. Uh, the result of this formula is an approximation of your data. And um, uh, when you apply the formula, you basically, uh, what you do uh, is estimating these two coefficients. And uh, these are the estimates that you find as I don't know okay and you might have more than one predictor uh, hence the certain number of predictors but in, in uh, uh, biostatistics you have uh, many predictors so in gene expression you have hundreds of predictors but what is important to estimate is the error size which is the residuals and then uh, so there are two approaches basically there is a cost uh, approach or the, uh, the loss function that takes consideration of the minimum difference. This is a minus minimum difference um, between your data and your estimations. And this is the gradient descent algorithm. Uh, and then we, we have no time, uh, but basically, uh, again, let, let's go a bit. The other approach is the maximum likelihood, which uh, considers the probability of a, a normal distribution, a Gaussian distribution, and the likelihood function. So basically, multiply it, it, um, it multiplies each probability of your that your data can verify, and uh, multiplies the probability uh, to have a predictor of the probability to have a likelihood. So the maximum probability that you can uh, find this, um, the data that you want, uh, with this, uh, uh, we, um, and then uh, this is a bit of algebra to show you what happens inside the formula when you make a model. Basically, there is a matrix that combines, basically you, uh, this is your predictor, okay? So you, you imagine that you have uh, y equals to b, beta x, uh, beta is x, and how do you calculate the beta? Okay, you need to uh, bring the x on the other side. So basically, imagine that you have a certain number of x's, so you have a matrix. And what happens here, is that you reverse the axis uh, on a transpose matrix and then multiply by the matrix and then uh, put it on the other side of the equal sign. Okay. 
And then at the same time, you have this, because when you multiply and divide two sides of an equation, nothing changes. Basically, the result is, uh, stays the same. Uh, this is a way to calculate the beta. But in R, it's quite simple, because you, you, you have uh, the estimation releases with the, with the function. With the function. When you look at the, uh, the summary of your model, for example, um, here there is a, like, uh, a manual calculation, let's say, of the beta. Uh, if I have a, a uniform, a random uniform of 50 values, and I have an intercept and a, a first coefficient, and then a variation, okay? Then uh, I did some uh, random errors, and I had this uh, random errors here. And then I, uh, this, this is what I use to uh, calculate my, uh, uh, my values, the values that I want to estimate, my estimation. So I do a linear model, for example, okay? I have just X as a predictor. Mm -hmm. Then basically the result of this, this is the plot, okay? The, the result of this model releases the uh, estimation of this coefficient, which is not these two values, okay? This is, they are different. But I've used these two to build a synthetic data to use in my model. Okay. okay. So, yeah. So it's just like there's different ways you can do the linear regression. It's just a matter of knowing what formula you need to do to estimate your y, depending on what you're trying to analyze. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yeah. 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 Okay. okay. So yeah, I go forward because we, I have uh, one minute. Sir. Yeah. Uh, if you need one minute, it's okay too. I think it's just you and me right now. So if you have time. Yeah, but I need to. Um, you have to go. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, but I need to um, plug my uh, computer. Okay. Basically, what's happened is that uh, the um, here, uh, well, we we have uh, basically ended the uh, the chapter because. Uh, and then you want to, this is the, the residuals, okay? This is the result of your model. You mm -hmm. do the summary of your right. model. And what you want is basically minimize the error, okay? So as you can see, you have, uh, uh, this is your, uh, oh, wait, the estimate, okay? The, your X is most probably, uh, so influencing, um, um, so your your estimate is growing when it's x is okay active estimation and it's uh, uh, statistically significant. Mm -hmm. So okay, you have some some results, and then you can see that the R square is ninety percent, and the adjusted square is again ninety percent. Here, there's more to say what is the difference between the two, mm -hmm. the adjusted and adjusted. So basically suggested to use the adjusted as well because it's handled better the uh, variation uh, when you have more than, than one predictor. And again, you will want to consider the confidence intervals to see what are the maximum the minimum level of your uh, values. And then finally, if you got, um, uh classification model you look at the accuracy if you got a uh, regression model you look at the random square uh at the residual sum of square and uh, so you have different metrics uh, to use but basically what's happened here is that the uh, as you can see you uh, what um Basically, what uh, uh, is considered is even the correlation within the, when you have more predictors, you need to consider about the correlation. But uh, in this case, uh, what's happened here 
is this um, basically uh, it might seem to like uh, a bit strange, but it is just taking consideration of the fact that uh, the, the difference of your re observed data and your estimation matters. Okay, there, there is some difference. And you want to reduce this difference as much as possible. And to reduce this difference, you, you might need to adjust um, uh, things. But, uh, um, and um, so what happens here is you can see what how it changes when the R square changes. So this is one. This is no point eight. Hmm. Maybe. So basically, uh, this is um, this is one. This is uh, uh, eighty percent. This is zero. This is eighty-two percent. This is one. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Minus one. So uh, basically, you see that this is spread out around, and this is R zero. So you basically are not uh, have not be able to address your data around a certain value. So that uh, there is you 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 haven't um, found that value, the central value around which this data may most probably uh, be. So you need to change things on your model, add the predictor, add the interaction terms, um, change the type of model. This is when you are not identify the trend of it. So your audio is cutting out. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I can't hear. Okay. Ah, there we go. Still, I can't. Is it the, uh, the AirPod? Mm -hmm. Oh, there we go. Okay. Huh? Yeah. yeah, that was okay. Okay, so basically the, the, the regression with this uh, uh, categorical uh, variable is uh, like uh, uh, you, you might have the categorical variable instead of uh, um, just uh, continuous variables. And uh, uh, in, in this case, for example, um, so let's, let's see that uh, um, again we have two genes and uh, we have uh, 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 a group again. Now, what we are doing is uh, see what happened with the estimation of the group. And again, here and here is growing, and we are uh, uh, still using um, 
So we have the categorical predictor. Not the categorical predictor. So we are using a linear model. Okay. Uh, and what says us that we are dealing with categorical? Is the data group this way? They mm -hmm. form two separate groups, so they categorize on specific values. So they are like O, 0, O, 1. Right. And you're just looking to see the difference between essentially the means of the two groups, categories. So why would you do the linear model on this versus just a, um, a t-test to compare the means? Exactly. Exactly. Is there a reason to do the linear model over the, a t-test, though, for this? Um, uh, usually, what I, I will do is have a visualization before to make the model. So I would already know that they are, even if I look them, I see that they are zero and one. So I, I can see the combination that they will be grouping like that. So, okay. so am I not you know, I don't want to use that to see if the tendency uh, is to uh, maybe that. Yeah, it's, you can do that as well to see if the, 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 you see the tendency is slightly drawn. And in fact, the reaction uh, the, the is positive. OK, OK. Uh, yeah. And the adjusted square is very low. So 18%, the R square is 19. Mm -hmm. So this, this model is not good for this data. Right. But I think that they do it for uh, the third group of this. Okay, you. just to show that you can do it. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so in fact, there's some, some regression tools. Uh, using uh, regression model somehow, when, uh, and uh, this is uh, this non linearity behavior, uh, correlations, uh, the, uh, the variables, or creation of error terms, or non function variables, and outliers on high level form. There's more in the, uh, in the chat. Eh? About that. And uh, uh, so basically, uh, it's a, it's a, uh, so you, you can talk for hours. Yeah. So, a lot of statistics in one hour. <laughs> uh, okay, maybe you can see. That the the difference when you have uh, this one. Okay. Example, uh, but uh, when you, that's what it is that we the people in the USA, if you have like many samples, you can see the tendency. Okay, in this case, you can even one sample was enough for you to understand. Right. Uh, the tendency. Got it. Cool. Well, thank you so much for doing this. This is really good. I mean, yeah, like you said, I mean, there's so much there and there's so much like I have, you know, some basic statistics, but I, you know, this is combining like a whole course on linear regression alone just into one. one chapter. Chapter, yeah. 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 I'll have a lot more to explore with this, but um. I think yeah. there's some between what you created and then like what the book has. So yeah, you, you can even uh, spend some time about here about what, how how to deconstruct our square and uh, based on the receiver square and other things. So that um, got it.
yeah, for example, I uh, I don't use it uh, as it is very often for the weekend. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, can be about this one. Uh, it's a, it's a traditional uh, that is that basically it's a radio. Mm -hmm. uh, that, um, you, you find somehow but I don't I don't you know I, I deal with in in, in, uh, in genomics it is always this is a question in genomics you always use a, a linear model or you have uh, use general linear model yeah so you don't need necessarily all of the tiny components of all of these this is more just showing that it can be done okay uh -huh. um, so, this is my and, uh, so basically it says that um when what what are the key points that you need to think about that yeah. you ever sent the residuals Versus the heated bars and that uh, how uh, so I mean, basically you do some uh, to uh, like teacher engineering, it's not teacher engineering. Um, it's like a uh, transformation of variables that's used for um, um, when there's some non linearity mm -hmm. in your data. So, right, you might want to just form your data with a logarithmic function or square them or do some like, yeah, lines or polynomial. Polynomial of higher degree. Mm -hmm. um, I think um, I think that um, the most important things have been said. Okay. That, yeah, I don't know if you have any other things that you want to talk about. Sounds good. Um. <laughs> I mean, well, that sounds good, but like, there's just so much to do, but I think it's a good stopping point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, anything else? You want to... Oh, go ahead. What? No, no, I think we have more questions the next time. We can, we can talk about them. Yeah. Um, I can chat you too on the Slack if that's okay. If I, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, because I'm sure I'll have more questions later once I really sit down and like work through more of the code and things like that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, anything else for today? I think you did a great job. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. Well, I'll see you next week then. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.